Good morning. I'm Helen Christians, and I will be your MC this morning. I want to welcome you to the Humanists of Greater Portland Sunday morning meeting. Uh, I want to welcome those folks who are joining us through Zoom and those attending in person uh, at Friendly House. Uh, that was quite an, our AV team is such a, a crack group that they can bring us all together this morning. And we really appreciate their ec excellent service to this organization. The Humanists of Greater Portland is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is an outlook or system of thought attaching primary importance to human experiences rather than supernatural matters. Humanists believe in the worth and goodness of all human beings and seek to find common values and respect among people. Humanists stay curious and open as they seek rational ways to solve problems by listening to others and speaking their own truth to find equitable solutions through science, reason, and free inquiry. Our topic at today's meeting, uh, communication, who is talking, who is listening, uh, presented by Dr. Gordon Oriens, especially addresses the humanist commitment of critical thinking. HGP is an all volunteer group that believes strongly in freedom of speech. But uh, for this morning's reading, I have a, a, a brief introduction of a royal guest. His Majesty, King Dave, first appeared at HGP in 2016 following Donald Trump's election to the presidency. It was to provide a nonpartisan alternative and make suggestions for a better America. This morning, he will uh, comment on the possible ways to reduce gun violence. It's ruling on guns and being more lenient about guns. We need, I know there are a number of ideas being floated to reduce gun violence in America, and most of them are being opposed by the powerful gun lobby and those who feel the Constitution gives them right to own a gun no matter what. The pro gun, the pro -gun people oppose gun licenses similar to driver's licenses for cars. But what if those licenses were voluntary, not mandatory? His Majesty proposes a seven section voluntary test for what should a responsible citizen know about firearms? Oh, section so one would cover the usual box. rules of safety, handling, and storage. Section two would cover instances where a good guy with a gun prevailed and prevented a tragedy from happening. Section three would cover the tragedies. The man who kept a gun on his nightstand and when the phone rang, he shot himself in the ear. The man who thought he was shooting a burglar, but it was his four-year-old who had gotten up for a glass of water. The toddler who got a gun out of his mother's purse and shot and killed her in the supermarket. The fourth section would cover statistics, such as that a person is more likely to commit suicide if there is a gun in the house, and the high number of women who are murdered by guns. Guns are no longer used just for target shooting, hunting, and taking care of the occasional rattlesnake or rabid skunk. They are used for personal combat and ur urban warf warfare. Section five would cover those cases where the FBI and experts thought guns were able to bring a situation under control without a lot of trauma. Section six would cover where the FBI and experts thought guns failed to bring about a good conclusion. When His Majesty took driver's education in 1957, the students were shown a, a film titled Death on the Highways. It was a collection of gruesome, morbid scenes of traffic accident fiction. His Majesty has tried to put them out of his memory but one scene showed a preschool age showed preschool age twins on a morgue table. Another showed only the top half of the skull. Section seven would be pictures of victims of assault weapons. As long as assault weapons are part of our culture, assault weapon owners and community leaders should know what assault an assault weapons victim looks like. Especially the child in Uvalde, Texas, that had to be identified by DNA. His Majesty doesn't want to look at pictures of assault rifle victims, but then His Majesty doesn't plan on using an assault rifle. If you don't have the manhood to look at gruesome pictures, you don't have the manhood to use an assault weapon. As His Majesty said, it would be voluntary, except 
persons running for public office would have to score at least an 85 on the test before His Majesty King Dave would, would vote for them. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I would like to now welcome back today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Gordon Oriens uh, is a professor emeritus of biology at the University of Washington, where he served as the director of environmental studies. Dr. Oriens was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1969, uh, 1989 and to the uh, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1990. Uh, Dr. Oriens will be speaking today on communication, who is speaking, who is listening. Welcome, Dr. Oriens. So glad to see you again this morning. Come on in. Well, it's good to be here. I enjoy talking with you. And the program, you will notice that I recorded this and it was projected for the uh, secular humanists at the University uh, at Horizon House here some time ago. Uh, it's, I'm motivated to do something about communication because although it's absolutely basic, uh, there's an awful lot of nonsense circulating around here. And I hope my talk will give you some guidance as how to think about the constraints on communication uh, and why certain things happen and other things don't happen. So with this brief comment, let's uh, have the video. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about communication. Everybody's talking about communication. There's all sorts of stuff floating around, uh, talking trees and everything else you hear. And a lot of it is not very well thought out. And so what I want to do is to give you some thinking tools mm -hmm. What you need to think about when you talk about communication, how, how communication has evolved. It's an evolved trait. It's white, widespread in the plant and animal kingdom from bacteria on out. Bacteria do a lot of communicating, actually. Uh, and so this is one of the features of, of biology. It has evolved under Darwinian natural selection. So in order to take a look at this, I'm first going to have to delve into Darwinian selection and talk about what is the, the rules on which have governed how communication signals can occur and the conditions that are needed if they are to evolve. And then what are the consequences of these constraints and what we see now, what the world of communication looks like. And so I'm hoping I'm going to give you some, some Thoughts, thoughts and ideas as you think about the communication. And to put it crudely, I, I hope at the end I will have improved your crap detectors. <laughs> there's a lot of crap out there. Yeah. It's floating around, ill thought of. But there's a lot of wonderful stuff out there, and I hope I can help you understand how to think about it and how to detect if there's a problem there that this looks flaky. Okay, and uh, we'll see, see how that goes. So the first thing I want to do is to say, how, what are the constraints under which a communication signal could evolve? So a communication signal is something in some sensory mode directed at some other organisms with the intent of changing their behavior. Because communication is fundamentally manipulative. You're to, you're to ch change somebody else's behavior. And so uh, how can that happen? So you give a signal. Uh, for that signal to have any uh, effect, there has to be some receiver who can take that information and do something with it. Uh, and they have to be able to do something with it that enhances their survival and, fit and fitness. Otherwise, there won't be any attention to it. It'll be ignored. But also, it has to be something that the recipient can't use that information to hurt the sender. No. Otherwise, that's a no-starter, too. So that these are constraints. It has to be something that there's some other individuals can respond to that helps them that does not harm the sender. Now those are pretty serious constraints. Uh, and that means there's a lot of sort of things that might be communicated that will never ever evolve because it doesn't meet those criteria. 
And also remember, we're talking about Darwinian evolution, so this is going to start out very rare. It's going to start out just one or a few individuals are going to start doing something. Uh, and, and so the conditions for the evolution of communication signals, like the evolution of any other evolutionary traits, how can it increase when it's rare? So it's going to start out rare. Now, uh, so the notion that uh, some patriotic song of, of singing does all this for you, well, it does that now. But that couldn't be anything like what it was when it started. So often the what gets things started evolutionarily is very different than what maintains them in, in, the, in, the, in the populations. So uh, I've given you the basic rules under which uh, communication signals can evolve. So to make this real, let me just give you a couple examples. Uh, uh, there are some little, tiny little beetles called pine beetles. Uh, and they make a living by attacking living pine trees, digging in, and getting into the cambium layer, which is the rich thing. Um, and they, they eat there, and they lay their eggs, and the larvae swing around, and in the process they can, can actually kill the tree. Uh, and as a matter of fact, right now, you've probably all seen pictures of the uh, lodgepole pine forest in British Columbia, miles and miles and miles of them dead. They were killed by these little bark beetles. Okay. And the same thing is happening for Norway spruce in Germany now, uh, by the way. So uh, what, what's happened and what's important, uh, one of the beetles gets, into, gets in and emits a pheromone. And a pheromone is a chemical produced a signal that is carried by the air. And this pheromone that the big beetle produces is attractive to other beetles. So they come piling in and you, they execute a mass attack on the tree and are able to kill it. Uh, but why is the mass attack important? Pines, as you know, got a lot of pitch. And with a small, a good healthy pine tree, uh, can easily pitch out and gum up a single or even a small number. So the mass attack is very important. And the fact that uh, the tree is already weakened, as the pines in British Columbia are from heat now, that, that means that the attack is very successful and you can kill thousands of trees. So, uh, so what's the situation? There's a pheromone, which is the signal. Why does it work? Because the recipients gain from joining the one that gave the signal, and you, you get a mass attack, and it's beneficial for everybody. Okay. Let me give another example. Uh, there's a marvelous orchid, the genus Ophrys, occurs in Mediterranean Europe. And this is the most unusual looking orchid. It's sort of metallic, and it also produces a pheromone. And the pheromone mimics a pheromone produced by a female wasp. So there are male wasps that hatch out, they attack, perceive this pheromone, they fly to the orchid and try to copulate with it. In the, in the meantime, they pick up pollen and move to carry it. And it depends upon the, the, the wasp being not so smart that it isn't one trial learning. It has to go to at least another, one other uh, orchid before this works. Um, and so uh, it's a situation in which uh, the orchid wins because it, it gets pollinated. Uh, but I just told you the only way signals can work is if the respondent is, gets a benefit. And here, uh, the wasp has been duped. The wasp is thinking it's getting a, a nice sexual experience and it's, it's trying to copulate with a flower. So what I just told you, I mean, that shouldn't happen, should it? Why doesn't it? Why, why hasn't a counter-evolution happened? Why is that still there? Well, uh, the probable reason, or the two, two combination of two things. The orchid is relatively rare, and so the vast majority of wasps that hatch out don't, get a, don't have an orchid around, and the, the pheromone that comes that they're attracted to is really coming from a female wasp when they go and, and get the right thing done. So the vast majority of them uh, don't experience this at all. So most of the wasps don't, aren't around an orchid, which is fairly rare relative to the wasp. The other thing is that it doesn't really hurt the wasp that bad. 
uh, his feelings may be hurt, you know, but um, uh, it's a little bit out and go to another, and the wasp is still available too. So the negative effect on the wasp is very small. Uh, the percentage of the population that is affected, so the selection, the counter selection to stop it uh, from happening is very, very weak, and so that's probably why it's maintained. Now, an important part of this example is that uh, we need to understand counter selection because often signals get responses and there's a, elaborate responses. And this, can, as I'll show you in some exa other examples, may, may gather and get pretty, pretty, pretty d dramatic. Uh, and uh, things that are very da potentially very damaging. Because when you signal, um, there's an intended recipient. But everybody else out there that's capable of perceiving gets it too. And so if you're signaling that you're going to track a mate, and you may attract a predator, and so there's often very important counter selection. So uh, these things, and the counter selection against it will be a, a part of examples that I will discuss with you in a few minutes. So, uh, so here are two examples, and they, they meet these criteria. And it's important, another thing that's important to remember about this is that there's no evidence that any of these actors have any awareness of what they're doing. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think anybody has ever proposed that the um, that the the bark beetles uh, are aware. Okay, it's time to bring a bunch of people in. You know, uh, that they're they're totally unaware of what they're doing, and it's quite obvious that the orchid has to be totally unaware of what it's doing because it doesn't have any brains at all. Um, and so, uh, an important thing to 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 remember is that uh, we don't assume in all of this stuff that the signaler is aware of what it's doing. But what natural selection and evolution produces is massive amounts of competence without comprehension. Competence without comprehension. And I've given you two examples of competence when almost certainly there is no comprehension. And this is extremely widespread in nature. And it's more widespread among human beings than we like to admit as well. Okay. So uh, important that uh, when we're talking about so and so signaling, I'm not necessarily assuming that the individuals or individuals are aware of what they're doing or have any sense of it. For most of these cases, they probably don't. So these are the first tools that may be useful in thinking about communication. Uh, the next one is I, I need to explain to you what sex is. <laughs> I mean it. Uh, OK. Uh, sex and reproduction are two very different things. Sex, biologically, is the combination of genetic material of two individuals. Reproduction is the production of new individuals. To see the difference, some of you have had biology, a little paramecium, the one-celled uh, animal that swims around and does this. Paramecium has sex. Periodically, they get together and join, and they share genes. We're polite. We call it conjugation. But it's sex, OK? Um, and then, then they part and swim around, and later, they reproduced, and they're pretty clever. They multiply by dividing. Uh, and so uh, sex and reproduction are totally separate. And you can see this. Why is it that we get them all confused together? Because the only time in a multicellular organism you can really exchange genes is at the unicellular stage in the life cycle. That's when it can happen. So it always. For the, the multicellular organisms that we know about, the exchange of genes occurs right when you get to that one cell uh, stage in the life cycle, which is when, when you can exchange, and that's when reproduction is occurring. So they co-occur, even though they're not the same thing. So uh, there's, and what, to further say, sex, fundamentally, it's universal 
in nature. Oh, the number of species that don't have sex is minuscule compared to those that do. And sex has certain characteristics. And uh, in general, uh, in organisms, there are identifiable two kinds of individuals <coughs> with respect to sex. One kind produces gametes or eggs uh, that are fairly large and have a lot of energy in them to help support the next generation. And the other tends to produce a lot of very tiny sex cells. Uh, the first kind we call females. That's the definition of a female. That's an individual that produces gametes, sex cells, that have stored energy to help the next generation go on. And the other one is we call the male, and that produces a lot of very, very tiny sex cells that get distributed. The result of this is that nature is full of the following pattern, that there are millions of sperm and pollen, if it's plants, chasing a small number of eggs. And that's throughout nature. And it's really captured in a delightful poem by Aldous Huxley um, that I would like to read to you. It's called The Fifth Philosopher's Song. OK? And I'm quoting now Aldous Huxley. A million million spermatozoa all of them alive, out of their cataclysm but one poor Noah, their hope to survive. And among that billion minus one might have been advanced to be Shakespeare, another Newton, a new Don. But that one was me. <laughs> shame on it. Shame to have bested your uh, Ousted your betters thus, taking ark while the others remained outside. Better for all of us, forward homunculus, if you'd quietly died. <laughs> that, that's one of my favorite poems, and um, it uh, just captures so much. So, so remember, we've got then throughout nature vast numbers of sperm or pollen, as we call them, and plants are chasing a small number of eggs. And that has all sorts of consequences we see unfolding for all, all sorts of organisms, including humans. OK, so uh, one of, that's, again, part of the toolkit, the learning toolkit that you want in your head as you're thinking about what's going on. Uh, the next, the last thing of the toolkit stuff that I want to mention is um, the, the evolution then of parental care, investment in the offspring, that what the parents put into the offspring when it's put forth into the world to help it survive. And so this is enormously varied. And of course, given the fact that it's the female that produces the big egg, and the sperm doesn't have anything in it except some, some DNA, that investment that way is overwhelmingly female. Um, and the, uh, so the, the parental care, and an awful lot of organisms, parental care simply exists. Some energy put into the, to the offspring as it's, as it's tossed into the environment. And this can vary, very enormously. In plants, uh, it goes from and the plants, it's the seed, which has the stuff, right? Uh, a very important evolutionary invention, the seed. And that is the packaging of energy for the next generation by the plant. Um, and sp seeds are varied enormously from almost microscopic and, microscopic and orchid seeds. And to the biggest plant seed of all that I'm sure you love to eat, I'm sure you've had it, it must be one of your favorite uh, flavors, the coconut. That's the world's biggest seed. And all that energy there, that means that when it germinates, it can make a pretty big seedling, because it takes, you've got to make uh, stems, you've got to make roots, you've got to make leaves and all this stuff, during which time the, the plant isn't doing, making any energy, it's just burning up energy, getting established, and then finally, uh, it gets, it's got the leaves and everything, and it can start photosynthesizing, photosynthesizing and paying back. So, uh, 
And in animals, a lot of that is true. This may be uh, putting a protective capsule around um, uh, the eggs. Shark, shark egg cake capsules are famous. They're, they they put a lot of protection around them to help uh, uh, keep the the embryo safely while it's developing a little harder for predators to get out. So a lot of this parental care is is very widespread and extremely important. But most of it doesn't relate to signaling and and, and selection because it's. Uh, once the sperm or the egg gets to the sperm or the, or the pollen gets to the plant, uh, it's going to go for it. And it's what, what we basically have given the fact that there's thousands of uh, sperm chasing little small number of eggs is we've got the evolution of choosy females and, and just males that don't care or take for anything. And this is a widespread thing in, in nature. So, anyway, but there are some examples of parental care where it is, is relevant to selection. And I want to just give you one example of that. And, it, and it, the most interesting ones are actually with amphibians, reptiles, and fish. Where the, 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 you know, the midwife toad where the eggs are carried on the back, uh, and, the, and seahorse males carry the eggs. And, uh, carry them around the back. So there's some wonderful stuff there. And, uh, and females are able to judge when she's going to mate with a male CEO. Is he going to be a good carrier of the babies? OK. Uh, but the most interesting example I know of, and it goes way back to some of the first studies by Nico Tinbergen, uh, the, the Dutch um, biologist, uh, evolutionary biologist, that uh, did all of his work in Oxford and was the recipient of uh, the Nobel Prize in physiology, along with a couple of other people. Uh, for, for this, this sort of work. And just instantly aside, the Tinbergen family must have been absolutely amazing because there were two sons and they both got Nobel Prizes. He got the Nobel Prize and uh, his brother, uh, older brother, got the Nobel Prize in economics. And that's really, I think that's the only, only case I know of, of of two people in the same family uh, to get to get Nobel Prize, that must be uh, the genotype in there must have been amazing. <laughs> but anyway, Nico Tenbergen started to doing some studies uh, with a little fish called the three-spined stickleback. It's a common it's a common fish all over the northern waters that's common on our coast here, uh, and uh, some of them migrate up into fresh water to spawn. And what happens is the males make a little nest and stand there in court. Because uh, what the male can do then if the female legs move water across so the lake, eggs get oxygenated. So the male is very important. And the female isn't going to, if she just deposits eggs anywhere, she isn't likely that they're going to get anywhere. But here's the male who will watch over them oxygenate them and chase other things away. So she wants to find a man. And she's, and she's going to lay her eggs there. He's going to take care of them. But isn't that simple? This guy's going to sit there for a long time guarding the eggs. What's he going to eat? Oh. What does he do so he can stay comfortable? He eats eggs, <laughs> including some that he may have fertilized. And so what the males will do, will actually go and try to steal eggs from another male, get a big pile there. You know, and this is a signal then, I'm a really good guy, I don't need eggs. You know, um, Again, I'm speaking as though they knew what they were doing, but this is confidence without comprehension, OK? But so uh, there is this, and the males, in fact, do eat some eggs. But the female has to decide. And the, so the female sticklebacks are making some pretty sophisticated uh, decisions about um, is this where I want to lay my eggs? Is this is this guy going to take care of them or is he going to eat them? <laughs> and uh, this is really subtle and it goes on. There's some interesting stuff going on. It's been studied, but that shows you that again the discriminations that can be made as a part of this are, are pretty interesting and are pretty subtle. And so it's um. um really fun to look at this sort of thing. And so the evolution of parental care, most of it, as I said, occurs before there's any discrimination. And it isn't affecting the mating success or clues. Uh, and some of it is in the stickleback case is one. OK.
So that's, those are the, basically the thinking tools that I want to present you with that if you want to evaluate any uh, situation of c communication, this is what you need to think about. Uh, and I hope then that your, if I can put it bluntly, your crap detector is a little bit better than it was half hour ago. Okay. So to follow on with this, to show the patterns, um, I would like to compare birds and mammals, because these are two groups in which there's very extensive parental care. And it uh, is very important in, in influencing uh, uh, mate selection and everything else. There are also uh, organisms that we sort of understand um, and know a lot about and care a lot about. So, uh, the other big group are all, was all sorts of fascinating stuff that's going on are the social insects. But that's a whole other course. Um, I'm not going there tonight. Um, and don't ask me any questions about that either, by the way. Um, but it's marvelous. The social insects are incredible. But we got casts and all sorts of stuff. And it's, it, it's really, really complicated. And uh, you can't just say. But with respect to birds and mammals, we know them. We understand them. We happen to be one. Um, and, uh, and we're familiar with what's going on. So let's look at mate selection and parental care in birds and mammals. Now what's very interesting, in mammals, Biparental care is extremely rare. Parental care is almost exclusively by the female only. And one of the main reasons is that, uh, obvious one, male mammals don't produce milk. Um, I've got some nipples up here, and I don't know what good they are. I just hope they don't start producing milk someday, but no, they're, uh, we, male mammals, have very limited opportunity to, to provide any parental care. Uh, for uh, a gazelle, for the male to come up and drop a bunch of grass in front of the female, well, she can pick up her own grass, you know, it doesn't really help much. So the only examples, of very few examples of biparental care in mammals are social carnivores, like wolves where the males go out and, and do, do the hunting and bringing in prey, and it could be shared with the females and the babies. Um, and it, it happens with the hunting dogs. So this is, this is one example, example of uh, biparental care, where the, or it's in carnivores, because it's very, very difficult for the females to go out and, and do it. But, but, uh, so, but those are almost the only cases uh, except for us that I'll come back to a little bit later, of, of biparental care in mammals. And if you've watched the primates, you know, and they're the a great big deal, big deal of a male gorilla holds a baby and his picture's all over the place, a big deal. Because the reason it's such a big deal is they don't usually pay any attention to the babies. <laughs> and they're raised, raised by the females entirely. Uh, and this, this happens, uh, it's made possible because uh, the major investment, uh, is the, the distinctive mammalian feature is the production of milk uh, by females. Now when it comes to birds, it's totally different. Because other than laying eggs, there's nothing that a male female bird can do that the male can't. And so the normal thing in birds is biparental care. About 90% of all birds is biparental care. That is, both the male and the female cooperate in, in, in incubation, feeding the babies, you know, because both birds and mammals have very extensive parental care, uh, culminating in the, the species I'm talking to that has the most elaborate, unbelievable parental care. And I can, I can tell you from personal experience, it never ends. <laughs> okay, so birds are overwhelmingly uh, biparental care. They're, in that sense, monogamous, but uh, modern genetic tools have shown that there's a lot of hanky-panky that goes on, uh, uh, other stuff in the bushes, and so in a lot of birds, uh, 
ostensibly monogamous, there's mixed parentage in the eggs, and that's another story. But uh, so the question is uh, then, what, where is it among birds that you don't have biparental care, where it's all uniparental care? And when there's uniparental care, what this sets in, in um, motion is natural selection for the exa exaggeration of male characteristics. Because then we have the situation uh, where uh, a single male can fertilize a lot of females. Because the male is not going to provide any parental care. He's not limited by the, the amount of babies that he would have to take care of. And there are two places where this shows up in birds. The first is in pheasants and chickens and grouse and relatives, where uh, these are the precocial birds, as we call them precocial, because when the babies hatch out, they can run around and feed themselves. You, know, you can raise babies, you can buy baby chicks, and nobody has to teach them how to feed. Uh, all, all the mother has to do is take them to showing where the food was, and they do quite a good job of themselves. So uh, the female can, doesn't need any male, and a big conspicuous male hanging around may be a, not a good thing anyway, because uh, hiding from predators is the big thing. So that in these birds, and you know, pheasants, grouse, these sort of things, we have elaborate uh, displays where the males get together and display and fight for one another. And you've all seen pictures because of the, 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 the movies that you can see on television now with the, of the grouse strutting around and fighting and all of this. You've all seen that. Um, and the, the thing is that uh, that could be driven that way because um, the, the males then fight and who, it's a lottery. Who gets, who gets the fighting and wins it? In the sage grouse where we know, where you've seen all of these, um, in a given year, one male will get about 90% of all the matings. <laughs> and the females, you see pictures of the females come through and they aren't paying any attention. Ah, they're watching these guys, they're looking and looking. And it ends up, um, one guy gets almost all of them. And this is the true in other, where you have this kind of communal thing where the males are around. They're strong, and most males get one shot at it, and they get really burnt out. And the, one year is it, and one they, and there's a lot of them chasing a few eggs, and most of them don't father anything. The other group is uh, forest birds that eat fruit. Now, now fruit is very interesting because um, I was watching today on the deck, there's robins coming in on the fruit bushes by the, by the dining room, and they can sit, and in a couple of minutes, they can load up, and they don't have to feed for a long time. Now, so you can eat really fast. Whereas we're having to fight insects or stuff in the garden, that takes a long time and you're spending a long time eating, uh, looking for food. So the, the, uh, with fruit, uh, the males can go off and tank up right away because if you're going to be on these dance grounds and be, being around, uh, uh, you can't eat while you're there. So you've got to be able, if you're going to last at all, be able to quickly run over and get a meal and come right back. And so it's with the fruit eating birds that you get this. And it also means that uh, those are the ones in which the females are able to raise the babies alone. They lay the eggs and incubate and, and raise. In those species where you get all of this, uh, the females raise, do all of the, the breeding un, um, unassisted by the male. The only thing they get from the male are genes. So this becomes highly selective. Uh, where the females are really choosy because you're not going to get anything but genes from this guy. And you want to put him in tech, is he healthy, is he good? So you put him through the works. And you get these exaggerations. And you all have, how many of you have seen uh, pictures of the birds of paradise? Most of you have seen that? I mean, they're just unbelievable, these displays. And uh, the males are good. They're, all of this, the females sitting and watching. Uh, and this is dri driven <coughs> to ex extremes because now there's, the females could go around and pick. This guy's displaying, he's got his bower or whatever, a spot where he's singing, and oh, take a look and go to the next one. The females, the opportunity to choosing, and the only thing that matters is the quality of this guy's genes and also that he isn't sick. 
because you don't want to get sick copulating with them. Uh, so you, you, you assess his health, but then you look, how, how good is he at doing all this complicated display stuff? And it derives into more and more and more complicated. Uh, the, the females put the males through this. And they'll do this and this and this and, and these un unbelievably elaborate displays. And so it's driven by female choice when the only thing she's looking for is genes. Because he isn't going to get anything else. But there's another interesting question. How come this has happened in New Guinea only? And that's where the birds of paradise are. This, that's only in New Guinea. And those extremes, there's nothing quite like that anywhere else in the world. So uh, when you're displaying like that and doing all that stuff, these males, not only are they announcing to the female, every predator in the, around the country knows where they are, right? You can't signal all of this to the females and not signal to uh, individuals you'd rather not be signaling to because they can hear it and see it and follow it. And so there, this is an example where there's strong counter selection because uh, you can advertise and recipients that were not the intended recipients but who can benefit it as your, at your expense come out. So uh, what sets the counter selection is uh, the, either the attraction of predators or having to handle this great big bulk and, and take care of it is, 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 uh, is disadvantageous. And we know that from survival records that is sometimes the case. But why in New Guinea did this go so far? There are two reasons. One is the counter selection is really weak. New Guinea, other than bats and a few rodents, the New Guinea mammalian fauna is entirely marsupials. And marsupials, uh, particularly in New Guinea, but also in Australia where there are more of them, uh, have produced very few really effective carnivores. And so on, in New Guinea, there are really almost no carnivorous mammals running around on the floor to, to nab these guys. And uh, they're in the dense forest, and there are hawks. But that's a, that's a really hard place. Well, hawks know where they are. Uh, but it's really hard to capture them. And so the males are pretty safe, they're displaying, and, and, they, and uh, they're all alert, and so if a hawk comes around, they all, these guys all know, but they're very hard to get. So that uh, you have not, uh, the counter selection in, in terms of predation in New Guinea is especially weak compared to other places where there's the full mammalian fauna, uh, weasels and everything else walking around. <laughs> None of which exists in the beginning. The other is what's, what's going on up in the trees. There's another thing that New Guinea doesn't have are apes and monkeys. There are no apes or monkeys up in the canopy. Um, apes and monkeys are magnificent fruit eaters, right? And in, in the tropical forest where they are, um, they're they're tremendous exploiters of this. The only arboreal mammal produced up besides bat in New Guinea is a tree kangaroo. And if, have any of you seen the tree kangaroos in the zoo here? Mm -hmm. yes. You sort of look, have this kind of expression, and I'm being really silly of this, and what am I doing up in the tree? <laughs> they, they are really, really awkward, and they can hardly move around. Um, and one of the big worries are that you know if if we're going to preserve the stuff in New Guinea, by all means you have to keep apes and monkeys out. You you cannot let them get in there because this will kill everything. Well, what this also means then is that the frugivorous birds have all the canopy fruits for themselves. They're not having to compete with monkeys and apes. So they got it all. So they can all really tank up fast. The males can get something to eat and really back right there. And, and they're doing all this crazy stuff for weeks and weeks on end without uh, starving, because they can tank up on fruit really fast. 
and so can the females, and fruit will become an important part of the diet of the babies. So this has been driven to this extreme uh, because the counter selection in New Guinea is unusually weak. And that's why we, we do get the, the uh, uh, there are uh, mannequins and some of the, the cocks of the rock and birds like this, frugivorous birds in the, neo, in the New World tropics uh, that uh, do some things fairly elaborate, but nothing to that extent. And there's nothing quite to the extreme because there are monkeys in the New World. There are monkeys all over in the canopy, no apes. Um, but um, but also there are lots of other predators, predator-rich environment, and so the counter selection against it is much stronger there. So how far so sexual selection and the choice, and how much you're going to make that male go through before you decide to copulate him with him, is related to uh, the strength of the counter selection, and we know that uh, a lot of uh, in a lot of species, the, 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 the males being driven to bigger size um, hurts. They don't survive as well. One very interesting study done with the species, the, the gray-tailed grackle, which is one of the blackbirds uh, that flies through Central America and into the southwestern states. And the males are much, much, it's, they have mating and the, and the males defend a spot and the, and the females do all the work. But the males are much, much bigger and have huge tails. And so uh, ornithologists in Texas realized that a bunch of the grackles were gathering in the winter in a leafless tree before going to roost every night. So every week he took pictures of the, of the flock of birds in the trees. And the, big, the males are so, so much larger than the females. He could sex the birds in the tree. And you watch over the months of the year and the percentage of birds that are males is dropping. Males are dying at a faster rate than the females. They're paying. So that's a form of counter selection. And also, they see this big tail, the really in strong winds, which a lot of in Texas, the strong winds can ground the male. It just simply can't fly in them, and the females can still do it. So there's, there's always counter selection going against this stuff. Uh, and the nature of the counter selection and the way it works is uh, really important to how far this can, can actually go. Let me then turn to the mammal you thought, we probably most of you thought I was going to be talking about most of the evening anyway, right? <laughs> right? Right, okay. Us. <laughs> and um, I've saved it to the end because we are a remarkable mammal. We all know that. Um, but we are remarkable in ways that affect this whole business of uh, parental care and everything. Now, the certain aspects of, of our current behavior that, to me, as an evolutionary biologist, look exactly right. Uh, the males compete for status with big yachts and big houses and that you've got to show them off and everything. And, uh, and the females compete by uh, fancy clothing <laughs> and, and showing off. And it's only young, scantily clad females that are at the football games with the pom-poms. And I don't expect in my life to see scantily clad males doing that. Um, and you don't expect it either, do you? Okay. So uh, also in... Um, there's a, a lot of stuff in my book that uh, Joan referred to at the beginning <coughs> of a, a lot of examples how <coughs> natural selection acting us in the African savannas have influenced our interest in sunsets, our interest in tree shapes and flowers, all this sort of stuff. So there's a whole lot of stuff of ours, and I can go into great explanation of that. Just fit exactly the kind of pattern I've described in other mammals. Okay. But the reason I saved us from the end, that then things get weird. You've noticed that all these other <coughs> birds and mammals, other stuff I've talked to about, I haven't emphasized them, but they're based on natural resources and the control of space and, 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 and resources, natural resources. Uh, and <coughs> it's land, <coughs> controlling a space, 
and resources are based on. And over much of human history, that was also true. Uh, we were uh, land-based, and the most common form of widespread, almost all human society is polygamy. And if a male got control of a, a bigger bunch of resources, he could get another wife. Uh, and so, uh, in these societies, the your social status was directly correlated with your reproductive success. The top ranking individuals had more kids than the lower ranking ones. One of the things that has happened very recently is that that's no longer true. It's now the reverse. Higher ranking males and females have fewer kids than lower ranking. Just, and this is the first time in human history, and this is fairly quite recent, you know, even uh, not too long ago in Washington state, what were our, what were our big resources? There were big conifer trees and wheat. That was our economy, right? It's not where the con we're still growing those, but they're dwarfed. One Boeing 737 is worth millions of bushels of wheat. And even, uh, even more so, um, a cell phone. What has given you status now has nothing to do with land. And in fact, owning land is a detriment now. One of the wonderful things of watching Downton Abbey is having a lot of land in a big house is a burden. You gotta take care of it. And the land doesn't make that much money. And he marries a very rich American woman to try to keep it afloat. And, and this is true of all these, these big estates in, in, um, in Europe. They're, they're, they're battling to, to, to stay alive because wealth isn't coming from that bit of land you're gonna have you got there to raise. It doesn't it doesn't this isn't the source of anything. So we have, as a result of the, the recent evolution, separated. Uh, the generation of wealth from natural resources in the environment, and none of it is space related. And this is the first time this has ever happened, and it's really quite extraordinary what's, what, what, what we're doing. Um, and this um, has a number of consequences, and some of them scare me, but now wealth doesn't come from natural resources at all. So the, the wealthy people don't understand the connection. You know, uh, food comes from the grocery store. And as a matter of fact, now it doesn't even come from the grocery store. So you're not going to the grocery store anymore. You're having it delivered. I haven't been to a grocery store since COVID started. I'm probably not going to go back. It's rather nice to have it delivered. So, but I, so I don't have. This breaks the connection between the natural resources that also, we still do eat. But even though it takes only a small percentage of the people to grow all the food, and most of us, and wealth is accumulating. The way you get uh, wealthy is not to buy a farm. No, it, it, there's, there's no wealth there now. So the land isn't the source of wealth, and it's, a, it's an albatross around the neck of people. And that's, that's, to me, the one of the most fascinating things about uh, Downton Abbey, to, to this view and to what, what it's there. So, but also means um, since you, all the connection is lost, do they care about it? And how can we, in a, in a in a world in which wealth is being massively generated, that there's no relationship to the natural resources on the land, even though we still need them, that's not where the wealth is coming from. Uh, and so we've got a really rather remarkable situation now uh, in which the relationship of status to reproductive success, the relationships of status and wealth to natural resources has been ruptured in a way that is impossible to even imagine. And where this is going to lead us, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uneasy. I worry about this, um, and um, I'm sure you do too. And I'll have to leave. I don't have any answers to this. I'll leave that to you. 
But I do hope that I've given you a few intellectual tools, a few things to help you when you hear somebody talking about communication. You say, well, let's wait a minute. Let's apply some of this to it. And I hope that maybe, maybe, I'm not sure, your crap detector is a little better. And so let me leave you with these words. I'm very old, but it's never too late to attempt other people's opinions to manipulate. But you are so smart. You are so clever. You've thwarted my endeavor. And so probably the legacy of this talk may be little more than a very blank slate. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. That was lovely and very interesting. I, I, I really enjoyed the uh, all the discussion about the birds and the you know that their behaviors affecting by the you know, what was available for them to eat and what did they need to protect themselves. That was, and the the New Guinea that was that was interesting that they they didn't have to worry about predators. That was enjoyed that and also you know the idea of uh, here we are. Um, land is no longer the value it used to be it used to that was how you made your you know your value and now it's uh it's it can be a burden so thank you thank you uh really enjoyed that i also know that this was very kind of you to present today because this is a very special day for you i i believe it is your 90th birthday am i correct that is correct oh wow can i I'd like to, uh, it will be silent because the Zoom folks are, are, are muted, but I'd like to give you a silent applause for most of us and a, a, a very happy birthday wish for your 90th birthday. That's an extremely special day and thank you for sharing all this information with us. It's a pleasure and life is still good. I'm excited and uh, what more can you ask? You that's know? right, that's right. Oh, that was a, just a, a brilliant presentation. Thank you. It meant a lot to me. And, and I think it was easy to understand, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, I could understand you. Yes, completely. Now we're going to move. Um, uh, we're going to move into the Q and A now. And I have a. Let's see. Al Christians, you have a question. Come on in. Yes, Gordon. Happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, I was, I you know, I was quite impressed sitting here. Uh, watching you think and hearing you talk simultaneously. Uh, this is a great ex example of communication, your subject. And it, it seems to me that the talking and the knowledge and the thinking all fit together particularly well in your case, but in general, they seem to go together that the voice would not be very useful to people if we didn't think a lot and the braid would not be nearly as useful to people if we couldn't talk. So I kind of think these things have co-evolved. Uh, do you agree with that? And what does the process of co-evolution lead you to infer about how all this worked out? What came first? Which, you know, where did we get one or the other? Did the braid drive the voice or the voice drive the brain? Or did they really start together, together like twins or something way at the early stages? How does this work? How did this come about? Well, this you've raised obviously a very fascinating question. Um, and uh, what's uh, we have di diverged dramatically from gorillas and chimpanzees. That uh, uh, when we diverged from them, they weren't the chimp wasn't exactly like the chimp of today. But we do know that the chimp of today has not changed that much from the chip at the time we diverged from it. So, and we had a period we were in, in Eastern African savannas when our brain tripled in size and it became the, the brain we have now and then it hasn't kept on getting bigger. So uh, the various features that uh, make us so different happened with this tripling of the size of the brain. And what was it that made our brains are really expensive they are very, very costly. This little three pound thing I'm carrying around uses about a quarter of all my energy every day. Um, and so it's, it consumes energy in an amazing way. So uh, the reason a lot of other organisms aren't any smarter is probably in my view that uh, the intelligence ain't worth it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it can be questionable 
uh, I think in our own case, whether it's worth it. But anyway, uh, it was, and I think that uh, almost certainly uh, the driving motive is, is social and communication. And uh, as, as we were uh, developing our, our, our complex societies, uh, we had to do an enormous amount of communicating. Um, and uh, a lot of it is to, to, to deceive. Nature is full of fake news, as, as we all know. We call it mimicry, uh, the, one of the most common forms. But uh, almost certainly it had, it had to do with uh, complex communication, uh, some of which was letting one another know what we were wanting to do. And a lot of it is deceit. Uh, so much of it, I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, a very popular game is poker. And the whole point of poker is you, you lie. And you, you don't want to let anybody know and you pretend to be what you aren't. Uh, and have, and the, if, if you don't know how to lie, you don't know how to play poker. And even um, major competitive sports, uh, you develop uh, knowledge of what the other, and you try to develop routines that they don't gonna figure out. And so it's, it's not, to, it is to withhold communication and, uh, uh, that's the power. And that's why, of course, when the Europeans colonized the rest of the world, the first thing they were very careful to do is don't teach them how to read. Yeah. Because uh, right. that, that you, you keep them. So that, that's, that's so, so powerful. I, I tend to think that the, the two uh, most important things that, that happened was, one, we, we became upright. We freed the hands. And uh, all the gorillas and chimps, when they want to uh, traverse, they get down and they knuckle walk. And they can stand up, but not very long. And they, uh, despite all the movies with the gorilla up and pounding his chest, that's not what they do. Um, and, and so freeing, freeing the hands uh, to manipulate stuff was tremendously important. And as I think I mentioned in a previous talk I gave to you, I think it's cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, what cooking does is outsource a lot of the digestion to the fire. Mm -hmm. So most of what we eat, we've it's already partly digested. Most of a lot of the work has been done, uh, and also cooking makes available a vast array of foods that um, uh, were not available. If you, uh, uh, the the grass seeds about eighty percent of human consumption today is the is the seeds of three annual grasses wheat, rice, and corn, uh, and none of which are edible without cooking them. And they store well, so that I think the uh, cooking uh, is, and uh, there's a wonderful book by, I'm forgetting, blocking a Harvard anthropologist, uh, Catching Fire, uh, How Cooking Made Us Human. I'll come up with his name in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that captures a lot of, of what, uh, what made us, uh, so that that it's hard for me to imagine a really complex society in science without the other invention that came along much more recently, and that's writing, uh, which is another big story. Because uh, I don't think you can have science in any society without writing. Uh, otherwise, you know, the 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 storage of information is old people. And I regret the fact that us old people aren't held in that high esteem anymore because we're, we're looking like we're a bit out, out of date, but the elder, that was, that was where all the knowledge was stored and uh, it was in human brains and what writing meant. I've never met Charles Darwin. I will never have a chance to meet him, uh, but I've been able to read what he wrote and I'm able to read what other people said about what he wrote. And therefore I have access to all of this knowledge. And so writing, uh, the invention of writing, which is really quite recent as we know, uh, is what triggered science and everything else. So that uh, I think there are a number of key things that triggered what we are and then set the stage for the fact that uh, we end up uh, gaining wealth from other than the land which is true of every other organism and which is true of, of us until very recently. Now, I don't know if, how well I've answered your question. I rambled around a bit. Come back at me if, I, if I've missed the, the mark.
the only thing I'd follow up on is uh, you mentioned how how the brain is a very expensive organ, but birds have voices and they also are remarkably intelligent, even though their brains are so small. Have they transistorized their brains or something so that they can 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 take advantage of their voices and and their apply their intelligence socially or something or what what's the what's the trick about how bird, birds are so smart with such small brains? Well, they they actually have pretty big brains, uh, and it's got a forward structure and, and things like that. Um, and if the the interesting thing is that it isn't simply brain size. It's brain size related to body size. Whales and dolphins have much, much bigger brains than we do. Uh, and they haven't invented science. Uh, so birds, and particularly things like crows and parrots that are unusually smart, have pretty big brains relative to body size. So what seems to be important is not just the absolute size of the brain, but its, it's size relative to the size of the body that it has to organ organized. And uh, it's not clear. I mean, uh, for a whole lot of birds, song is totally innate. Uh, you don't have to, uh, it's inborn, and which is very important because in most temperate zone birds, for example, that we know well, the males sing in the spring. And then when the territories are set up, they stop singing. And so the babies never even hear the, the song of their own species. Uh, and um, they, it has to be innate. Well, there's some where they pick up some of it, but uh, again, uh, I think in bird song and a lot of things birds do, there's a lot of competence without comprehension. Well, you said uh, communication has, I can't quote you exactly, but you said in effect that communication is the change, change of behavior of the other person. And I had a um, reaction to that in my in my own mind saying it's not, it's not the case all the time in a lot of cases the uh, humans are communicate communicating just to get a psychological satisfaction out of explaining his or her own uh, emotions to the to the other person now there may be an element of changing of behavior if you include in the definition of change behavior that it can increase the strength of the social bond. So that's my comment. I wonder if you have any comments to that. Well, I, I, I fundamentally agree what you say, or what you've just said, uh, but also remember that once you, you develop, a, a, the point I made earlier is that what's got something started and what maintains that are often very different. Uh, and uh, once we have developed this, incredible uh, richness of communication and ability to deceive uh, what a tangled web received when we once decide to deceive as Shakespeare said, uh, then it, be it becomes intellectually satisfying just to do it. It becomes something we enjoy doing. Uh, and uh, often we can do it with, with no intent that we don't have anybody in mind, but once something is very valuable and it becomes incorporated, it becomes fun just to do it. And we see that in all sorts of our, of, of our behaviors and communication is just one. So I think that's what you pointed, I think is true. And I think it is quite compatible with the general approach that I outlined. Thank you. Joyce has got our next question. Come on in, Joyce. Uh, Gordon, I would like to go back to your comment about the pine beetles. Yes. And I understand that the pine beetles are not necessarily communicating with the trees. They are communicating with other pine beetles. But what is the advantage to them, the evolutionary advantage, to killing their own hosts? Well, the evolutionary advantage, you're right, they're communicating with one another. Uh, and the tree is, is irrelevant in that sense. but. Uh, the reason it works is that uh, a healthy tree or most trees have this pitching ability. And if you co colonize the tree uh, and you don't bring some re re recruits in and overpower the tree, you're just going to get pitched out and die. So, uh, so that uh, without attracting more 
uh, other beetles, you're, you're likely to just die in there and not be, you're gonna be overpowered by the tree. So this becomes absolutely essential for success at all. And uh, the, the problem is that uh, th this occurs and you kill, you kill your resource and that happens every once in a while, but that's weak counter selection compared to the fact that you're not gonna make it at all except by bringing in other individuals and overpowering the tree. And we just had, uh, it's getting worse now because the, the trees are getting weakened uh, by the environment. And so uh, this has been going on for a long time and we haven't had these massive killings of the trees. And this is a somewhat new thing because mostly in the environments, uh, only a small number of trees are weak enough that you can overpower and kill them. And that was what it would probably was and you really didn't, do in your resource. And this is uh, one of the consequences we're seeing of uh, human-induced environmental change. Yeah, maybe we are uh, killing our own environment. Yeah, we're, we, yeah, we're beginning yeah. pretty good at it. And you yeah. ask, why, why do we do what we do, which seems counterproductive? And right. that's another story. But um, we evolved in, in the African savannah to be very, very good at dealing with Local things, small scale and short time, short term. Short and term. all of our problems now are big scale and long term. And we simply have a very bad psyche for dealing with that. We just. Thank you. Yeah. We don't do well at it. And that may be what's actually going to do us in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, Gordon, Renga has a question. Come on in, Renga. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll talk about the importance of voice. And you said about the writing, which made big changes in the human evolution. But I also like to refer to the, the advent of printing, which is only a few hundred years old, which made a revolutionary change in written communication. And of course, slowly it has evolved. And then in very recent modern times, now we are in the era of so-called digital communication. Okay, And never on voice, even the written or digital communication. Now, how is this going to change the evolution or to the better or to <laughs> our detriment? I don't know. Do you have any ideas on that? Well, I absolutely agree with you. I'm one of the people who thinks that uh, one of the gr greatest inventions ever was the printing press. Because you, you look at what was available with writing before, at least scrolls and written mm -hmm. uh, and Printed material was available for a very, very few people, and it was used to control other people rather than anything else. So the printing press, printing press made science possible, um, and 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 then we've continued on with digital stuff. That's just an elaboration of this, but uh, science was not possible until it was a printing press, uh, and modern. Civilization, the other, the greatest invention that has had more effect on anything else is by a guy that nobody knows the name of, and you've never heard of him, Carl Girassi. Have you ever heard of Carl Girassi? No. Why do I think he's the second most important invention in human history? The pill. Ponder that one, the pill. Uh, but, but anyway, no, back, back to uh, absolutely, uh, the printing press, uh, because these old, you look at these old scrolls and, and uh, they didn't have breaks. Remember that punctuation came on a lot later. Uh, I think the Indians invented the, 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 the period. Huh. The period had to be invented. That's rather a lot of communication. You did. And uh, James Joyce you know, and trying Ulysses and, uh, Getting, getting you to read something without punctuation, it's, it's really quite a stress. Um, and th but that's what everything was until quite recently with, with communication, all those scrolls, there, there were no breaks. I mean, and, and they were extraordinarily expensive to produce. So they were, they were not a part of mass culture. Now, what is going to be the effect of this digital communication not on well, the human uh, evolution in the future? I mean, uh, Can we say anything? We're, we're, I mean, um, we're in really uncharted territory. I mean, yeah. I just I, game change. I don't think my crystal balls are better than anybody else's here. <laughs> but I just, I, I, but they they scare me. 
yes, because sir. also with everybody living in cities now, uh, <laughs> nobody has any contact with nature anymore. Uh, nobody knows anything about it. And if you have any contact with nature at all, it's on some TV show. Um, and uh, that doesn't, it ain't the same. I love some of the TV shows, but uh, when I've wanted to help raise money for the Northern Great Plains, you bring people out and have them walk up to the bison herd. And it's a totally different experience from a, from a TV show. Uh, you walk up to the bison herd and they pull out their wallets. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just totally different. So I'm, I'm worried about the fact that we've become an urban animal with no contact to nature and all of the wealth is no longer re related to nature as I pointed out and it's, I'm scared, I really am. Uh, we have a, a Roy at Friendly House has a question. Come on in, Roy. Uh, uh, Gordon, I don't have your communication skills so I had to write down my question. And, and I, But I have a, a, a quick comment. I recently saw a TED talk where a lady developed a technique for counting the number of neurons in her brain, uh, basically by making a soup out of it, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and then went around and did this to all kinds of animals. Uh, birds have an extremely number, a large number of neurons for the size of their brain. So I, I suppose that you know they had to get the weight down in order to fly, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that crows are are on a par with monkeys. Yeah, um, flight, yeah. flight is a major constraint for packaging yeah mm -hmm. uh, um, but anyway my question is has digital communication shifted control of communication from the individual skill mm -hmm. to the uh technology and those who control that technology um i that, don't know i have any insights that you don't have i mean this is um not my not my field i mean i'm i'm a recipient here mm -hmm. of all of this and struggle with technology and going from having trouble to balance my checkbook to you know, dealing with the real world. So I, I don't know. I don't have any answer for you that I don't think I've thought of anything you haven't thought of. And I don't think my training gives me any particular insights into this. I wish it did, but sorry to disappoint you. I don't think I have much to say, yeah. which is unusual for me, as you know. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Anybody has a chance, uh, watch The Social Dilemma. It's an incredible uh, documentary about uh, 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 w interviewing the people who run uh, uh, technology and uh, how social, uh, um, um, what do they call it, uh, yeah. ha has really messed things up. And one of the, uh, one of the problems is that, uh, well, nature is full of fake news. I mean, I, I didn't get into this in, in my talk, but mimicry, all, animals pretending to be what they aren't, you know. Uh, uh, Trump didn't invent fake news. N nature, nature is full of it. And I didn't really go into it in, in much detail, but uh, so that uh, what we also know in the modern is that uh, errors and fake news spread faster than the truth. That's one of our the, the main topic to, to face where we've now got uh, major societies of which the, the United States is the key example, which you have half of the population that believes in evidence and the other half doesn't. I've had a lot of trouble with uh, evolution being not accepted and everything, but I've never lived in, in my whole life with, with a society that is such total rejection of science and scientific evidence as I live in today. I'm glad I'm old. <laughs> well, Gordon, you certainly have a young brain that you're able to, at 90, do such a uh, presentation without notes, without a PowerPoint, just shared your knowledge. And that was very, very much appreciated. Thank you. I, I have a very mixed relationship to PowerPoint. A love-hate relationship yeah. with it. Uh, and I've seen so many bad PowerPoint presentations where uh, the, the person just relies on it to what's going to come next. You know, I mean, uh, I've the vast majority of PowerPoint presentations I've seen were bad. Um, and I I use it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and I'm not totally against it, but for a talk like I just gave. Mm -hmm. 
illustrations PowerPoint would be distracting rather than helpful. Uh -huh. I think my talk was more likely to get through because I didn't use mm -hmm. any PowerPoint. Good. I know how to do it, but I think mostly it's misused. Mm -hmm.